excited. Well, last week uh, for our New Year's message, we meditated on the idea of new beginnings and of looking forward into 2020 with fresh hope. And in that message, we drew out some thoughts and applications about the immeasurable power of our triune God that he works towards those who believe in him. As I mentioned last week in the sermon, I always am really edified uh, when I look forward into the days of head and when I not, not just looking forward in the days of head, but when I do it with my hope in God and my hope and faith in him have been refreshed and strengthened. I always find it really edifying to look ahead. And so <clears throat> when we are confident in the goodness of God towards us and we look into the future days and we're not naive, we know there's going to be hard days and disappointing days and painful days. And days of suffering. But when we look ahead in faith, trusting in God's goodness in those future days, I believe that type of Christian is a bright light to a hopeless world. And when we're able to do this with confidence that God is our helper, then we can provide hope for the lost. And so it's against the backdrop of the sermon last week that I think it's particularly interesting that we resume our study tonight in the book of Genesis. Tonight, what we're going to see is a story that's filled with nothing but sin and chaos and looks super hopeless. And so I think it's a great continuation of what we considered last week, because one of the truths of the Christian life that's very important for us to grasp is that today's hope, it's going to be tested by tomorrow's hopeless picture. I mean, even look at our attendance. Last week, we had a super awesome service. Almost everything, everybody's here. You all saw that this week, there were one, two, three, four, six of us uh, here for worship. It doesn't phase me at all, but it's just remarkable to me how God works, the contrasts. And so we could get super encouraged one day, and the very next day, when things look different, we can panic and forget all of the hope that God gave us the day before. And so much of our lives is going to depend on what we do when our faith is tested in situations that have the appearance of the absence of God, that have the appearance of hopelessness, and that make us feel discouraged based on what we see. What you choose to do in those moments is going to dictate so much about your life. And so last time we were in the book of Genesis, which was several weeks ago, We studied Jacob's return to Bethel from uh, his time of 20 years that he spent with Laban. And so we saw that when he he let on his way back, when he let his fear get the best of his faith, it led him into sin and his sin had disastrous consequences for him and his family. But by the end of that story, we saw that God's preserving grace towards his people caused God to eventually intervene and force Jacob to go back to Bethel where God would forgive him, reaffirm him, and restore him. And thus, hope was interjected into the story of Jacob's life that had been riddled with dysfunction and sin. And so unfortunately, as we get back into the story of Jacob tonight, the story will again take a turn for the worse. And but what what we're going to see uh, by the end tonight is that at the point where it looks the darkest, it's the that that is the point wherein the, the, the dim lights of the gospel hope begin to flicker. And so our text for tonight is going to be Genesis 35, 16 through the end of chapter 37. So go ahead and open your Bible to Genesis 35, uh, verse 16. And we will begin by looking at verses 16 through 21. Verse 16. Then they journeyed from Bethel when they were still some distance from Ephrath. Rachel went into labor and she had hard labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Don't fear, for you have another son. And as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she called his name Benoni. But his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died, and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. 
And Jacob set up a pillar over her tomb. And it's the pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day. And Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. So here with this story, we have the completion of Jacob's household with the birth of Benjamin. Benjamin is now the second son of Rachel, the 12th son of Jacob overall, but the second from Rachel. And I would remind all of us that Rachel is the favored wife of Jacob. And so uh, Joseph was Rachel's first son. And Joseph's name means he adds. And so all the way back in chapter 30, verse 24, after naming Joseph, Joseph, Rachel says that she names him that in hopes that God will add to her another son. And so here with the birth of Benjamin, Rachel's longing for another son has been fulfilled. And Jacob's household is now complete through the birth of his final child. And unfortunately, no sooner does Rachel give birth than does she depart in death because of what the text describes as hard labor. And so the birth of Joseph, I'm sorry, of Benjamin, it is an extremely bittersweet moment for the family. Jacob has now lost his dear Rachel, the favored wife, the one whom he gladly served 14 years for, as she's now taken from him in a moment that was supposed to be joyful. And Jacob's now, his his final connection to her is through the two sons that she bore him. And so the text tells us, here comes Benjamin, Rachel dies, and then Jacob buries her on the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And he does this to honor his beloved wife, and he sets up a stone pillar. And so here, with a heavy heart and unable to celebrate the birth of their baby son with his deceased wife, Jacob had no choice but to just keep pressing on. Benjamin's born. Rachel dies, he buries her, sets up a memorial for her, and moves on. And <clears throat> it's crazy to me how, isn't it crazy sometimes when you read the, the scripture how it just kind of just states stuff and moves on? Like this is Rachel, this is his beloved, man. This is, this is his sweet and precious bride in the scripture's just like, and she's gone. And Jacob pitched his tent. And it's, uh, to me, I, I, I'm not sure this is the intention of the text, but one of the things that strikes me when I read this is just, man, life is just so brief. Here today, gone tomorrow. And Rachel is now gone, and Jacob has to just move on. And unfortunately for Jacob, in verse, 20, in verse 22, things are only going to get worse. Let's read. And while Israel lived in the land, and remember Israel is Jacob, he'd had his name changed to that. While Israel lived in that land, Reuben went and lay with Billa, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. So having absolutely zero regard for his father's pain and blinded by self-interest, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn son, he goes and he sleeps with Billa, and it is possible that it was a rape. Use the same terminology as what happened with Dinah back in chapter 34. Now, what would possibly motivate Reuben to do this? This is my opinion. Rachel was without question the favored wife of Jacob. And as we saw in chapters 29 through 30, this caused Leah, who is Reuben's mom, this caused her a lot of grief and heartache. And so when the favored wife dies, Leah is now in position to become the favored wife of Jacob. However, what still remains from Rachel is not only her two children, but also Billah, her servant. And this woman, Billah, had born Jacob two sons. So if you're Reuben and you want your mother to have the status of first place with her husband, what is one way you might be able to secure that and guarantee it? 
In my opinion, Reuben here is scheming. And Reuben defiles Billa, who was Rachel's servant, to lower Billa's status in Jacob's mind so that his mother Leah might become the unquestioned primary love of Jacob. That's my view as to why Reuben did this. And so, despite all the grace, all the victories, and all the work of God towards this family, unfortunately, disturbing sin is still a strong characteristic of this household. Hey, Dad, sorry that you lost Rachel. Let me go rape your servant so that my mom gets to have the favored status. And on the heels of this uh, statement here about Reuben, we have spelled out for us a list of the members of the household of Jacob. And for time's sake, I'm not going to read it, but it lists, it, it, this list contains all of the 12 sons of Jacob. And so it has been a wild journey. It has been a sinful journey. It has been a grace-filled journey. But by, uh, uh, and by God's grace, every failure and sin and obstacle has been overcome. Every danger has been subdued. And this family now stands complete with the birth of Benjamin, who is Jacob's 12th son. The 12 sons are completed now. It is just fascinating to me when you read the Bible, how God tends to complete things and set things up in the context of complete sin and ruin. <laughs> Let's go ahead and pick up in verse 27. It says, And Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years and Isaac breathed his last and he died and he was gathered to his people old and full of days and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. And so here this passage records for us the death of Isaac. And I think it's worth noting that Rebekah's death is never recorded in the book of Genesis. Her burial is mentioned near the end of the book in chapter 49, verse 31, but we never read about her death, which means I presume that she probably died prior to Isaac. She probably died prior to Jacob returning to the land. And to me, what's significant about that, if you remember about Rebecca, she was the one who masterminded the plan to deceive Isaac so that her favored son Jacob would get the blessing. But ironically, in Rebecca's craftiness and schemes to make Jacob the heir, what, she ended up being robbed of Jacob because he had to flee for 20 years and she never again got to see her son. But Isaac, on the other hand, this text tells us he did see him one last time before he died. And after, uh, after Isaac's death, just as Isaac and Ishmael had did for Abraham, Jacob and Esau bury their father Isaac. And again, later in chapter 49, verse 31, we learn that he is buried in the cave of Machpelah, which is where Abraham, Sarah, and Rebekah are also buried. Now that's going to become significant down the road. So remember who's buried there and who's not buried there. Rachel is not buried there. Leah is though. And that has redemptive significance down the road, which we'll get to. Uh, when we cover chapter 49. But for now, just remember that. Now, at the end of chapter 35, we're going to move into chapter 36. And as you see, as you look at chapter 36, we see the entire chapter is dedicated to tracking Esau's descendants. Why do that? Why interject an entire chapter on Esau's descendants? This is my belief. The reason for this is because all the way back from Genesis 3.15, the author has been concerned with tracking two lines. The author has been concerned with showing us the development of the seed of the serpent as well as the development of the seed of the woman. And so as we saw in Esau's birth narrative, as we saw in the episode of his apostasy through selling his birthright for red stew, red stew uh, as we saw in the episode of Isaac giving Jacob the birthright and in the story that records Esau's hostility towards Jacob and as we saw in the reality 
testimony of Esau taking Canaanite wives and then Ishmaelite wives, here we see Esau is without a doubt the seed of the serpent. And the final mic drop argument on that is Romans 9, which clearly identifies him as not truly being of Abraham. And so at the end of chapter 35, we see that Jacob's house as the seed of the woman has been fulfilled with the birth of of Benjamin. And now in chapter 36, the story also informs us about the progress of the serpent seed by telling us about Esau's descendants in chapter 36. And so for the sake of time, I'm not going to read this chapter, uh, but I will offer a brief summary. Verses 1 through 5 are going to show Esau's non-covenant status by virtue of his wives and descendants. And verses uh, 6 through 8 will highlight his non-covenant status in terms of the land. So in verses 1... In verses 1 through 5, we read about Esau's descendants coming through his Canaanite wives and his Ishmaelite wives. His wives highlight his non-covenant status because Ishmael is not the covenant son of Abraham. And the Canaanites are said back in chapter 15 to be great sinners against the Lord. Esau didn't marry from the godly line. He didn't marry from the Shemites as Jacob had done, as Isaac had done. He took wives from the godless and thereby it confirms his non-covenant status. And as we read in chapter 36 and verses 6 through 8, just as we saw with Lot and Abraham, we also see with Jacob and Esau that the land is not big enough to support Jacob's household and Esau's. Therefore, they parted ways and Esau leaves the land of promise and he settles in the hill country of Seir, which later becomes Edom. And so again, the departure from the land also highlights Esau's non-covenant status. And at the end here of the chapter in verses 9 through 43, 9 through 43 record the descendants of Esau in a detailed manner. And in this text, we have the descendants of specific chiefs and even of kings recorded because Edom is going to become a nation. And so as chapter 36 closes, we now have an awareness not only of the completion of Jacob's household, but also of Esau's line. And now as we move into chapter 37, the focus is going to pick up on Jacob's story again. However, it's going to emphasize not Jacob, but Jacob's descendants, especially Joseph and Judah. Primarily, it will be Joseph. Secondarily, it will be Judah. We'll cover Judah a lot next week, and we're going to uh, begin to cover Joseph this week. And so as we come to chapter 37, we are going to find that the generational family sin of favoritism is going to rear its ugly head again, and it's going to have catastrophic results. But what we're also going to see is that through all that will transpire, uh, (laughs) uh, just as we've seen in the book of Genesis so far, that even in a context of great sin, God's going to work, God's going to bring redemption, and God will even bring transformation. Even though I think we're going to see about, and maybe I'm wrong, I'm just going to have to, these maybe are the worst stories in all the book of Genesis that we're about to cover. So, sorry, it's not my fault. I'm not morbid. I'm just going through the scripture. Um, but these stories are crazy. So, let's begin uh, covering Genesis 37 uh, by reading verse 1. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. Um, sorry, that doorbell threw me off. Uh, okay. Uh, from the outset of chapter 37, the story records for us that Jacob, unlike Esau is living in the land of promise. He's living in the Abrahamic land. And so this statement right here provides a statement of hope, even though pretty much everything that flows out of this is going to be dark. And so uh, let's pick up in verses two, three, and four, and we're going to get we're going to see that things turn very quickly. Verse two: These are the generations of Jacob. So there it is. Like I mentioned, 
his sons are going to become prominent. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Billa and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him, and they could not speak peacefully to him. So here we find Joseph's story begins here by telling us that age, at age 17, Joseph is still a boy. And this boy was pasturing the flocks with his brothers. And we also learn in verse 3 that Jacob favored Joseph. And so the family sin of favoritism that destroyed the family of Isaac and Rebekah, it is now present in Jacob's family as well. And Jacob's favoritism, it was so obvious that he even bestowed a robe of many colors upon Joseph, which was a prized possession, and it represented Jacob's favoritism. So again, if we're following the story, we should know disaster's about to strike. The book of Genesis is remarkably clear that if you want to inadvertently be a murderer to your family then walk in favoritism. Favoritism has proven to be deadly in the book of Genesis. It caused significant marriage problems for Isaac and Rebekah. It caused murderous hatred to rise up in Esau towards Jacob. And it was at the root of Rebekah's sins of lying and deception. Through favoritism, Isaac's home and Jacob's home will be completely decimated. It is a dark, dark sin. It isn't cute, it's not justified, it's not loving, and in the end, it always brings death, sometimes in quite literal ways. And so if you have the sin of favoritism in your life or in your home, you need to put it to death with the utmost urgency because the unintended consequences of of favoritism, especially in the family, which is the context we're in, the consequences are tragic. And so what's one way to test whether or not you are walking in favoritism? Here's a couple of ways, I think. Do you find yourself making excuses for one person's sin that you would pound someone else for? Do you find yourself maybe giving special treatment to one person and you refuse to give it to someone else? Do you punish in your parenting one child severely for the slightest mistakes, but then completely ignore, minimize, or excuse massive sin in another kid? And if you are doing any of these things, it is likely that you are walking in the destructive sin of favoritism. And I would exhort you to repent before it reduces your relationships and especially your families to absolute ashes. So let's let's uh, return back to the story. Um, One last comment about the first four verses here is that we see in the first four verses that Joseph, as the one who is already favored, he brings a bad report about the sons of Jacob's maidservants, Billa and Zilpah. Now, their sons would be Joseph's four brothers, Dan, Naphtali, Gad and Asher. And so we don't know what the report was, but whatever it was, it wasn't good. Maybe while they were out uh, tending to the flocks together, maybe these four sons were lazy, were neglecting their work, or they were fighting or stealing. I don't know what it was, but whatever it was, they were misbehaving and Joseph told his father about it. So let's think about this here. When you are a rebellious knucklehead like these four boys, and you already resent Joseph for being the favorite. How do you think they're going to view Joseph here? Well, according to verse 4, their hatred is greatly intensifying to the point that they can't even speak peacefully to him anymore. And so I bet family dinner was wonderful. Here it is. The atmosphere for this family is absolutely nuclear at this point. And so in this horrible context, Joseph is going to have some dreams. 
And when he tells everyone about these dreams, it makes matters even worse. I'm going to pause real quick. Joseph gets pounded. I've heard, I can't remember. I can't tell you how many sermons I've heard that pound Joseph for being prideful here. But the text never says that, that he was prideful. He just talks about what happened. I personally don't believe he's doing anything wrong. It's just, hey, I had a dream. I, I don't know how many times I've heard uh, preachers just slaughter Joseph here about being arrogant. I don't, I, I don't see it. Maybe he was, but the text doesn't say that. It's total speculation. I don't think he's doing anything wrong. In fact, I think it's important for his typology later on that he didn't do anything wrong because it's through his innocence and unjust suffering that he becomes a sweet picture of Jesus. And so anyways, that's, that's down the road. Uh, but, but Joseph is going to have these dreams and he makes, uh, uh, and he, uh, Tells people about it and it makes everything worse. Let's read verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And the reason why the brothers hated Joseph even more when he tells them about this dream is because in verses 6 through 8, we learn what the details of the dream, uh, of the, what the details of the dream were. Let's read. He said to him, hear this dream that I've dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now, in this dream, the prominence of Joseph over his brothers is very obvious. And therefore, it triggers their jealousy even deeper as they think he intends to rule over them. Now, I would argue this dream is from God. And the reason why I believe it is because this dream proves to be prophetic. And so Joseph will indeed rule over his brothers. But the way in which that will come to pass, it is not how any of them would have expected for it to work out except for God. Now, to make matters worse, Joseph is going to have a second dream. And we find that in verses 9 through 11. Then he dreamed another dream, and he told it to his brothers, and he said, Behold, I've dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. And so here Joseph has a second dream. And Jacob, in verse 10, interprets this dream as a vision indicating that Jacob, uh, uh, Joseph's mother, which it's like adopted mother because his real mom's dead. Uh, But Jacob, Joseph's mother, and his 11 brothers will one day bow down to him. And so his father, likely aware of the problems that his dreams were causing the family, his father rebukes Joseph. However, verse 11 tells us that Jacob kept this saying in mind. Hmm. Why would Jacob do that? My opinion is Jacob knows what it's like to be visited by God in a dream because it happened to Jacob several times. And now he's pondering whether or not these dreams might prove prophetic. Now, the brothers, on the other hand, they become extremely jealous, which further fuels their hatred for Joseph. And so through these dreams, their jealousy is mounting. And some of the strongest fuel for hatred is jealousy. You can almost be guaranteed that if you walk in the sin of jealousy, hatred will not be far behind and you will begin to destroy the one that you are jealous of. So if God convicts you of jealousy... You have to put that sin to death. Because just like the sin of favoritism, it's one of these kind of sins you maybe don't realize is going on. And you may not realize it until there's been a ton of damage done. So if God convicts you about any jealousy in your life, you need to repent. Let's continue the story. Verse 12. Now his brothers went to pasture pasture their flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flocks at Shechem? Come, I'll send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now and see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. 
So here in these uh, uh, three verses here, Jacob is clearly concerned about his sons who are pasturing the flocks near Shechem. Now, why would Jacob be concerned about that? Well, if you're following the story, you'll remember that many men in Shechem were slaughtered by Simeon and Levi back in chapter 34 over the rape of Dinah. And when that episode had taken place, Jacob said that he feared that one day he and his household would be annihilated by by the surrounding neighbors. So if you're Jacob and you're sitting here and you hear that your sons are pastoring the flocks near Shechem, it's like, whoa. I have sons who slaughtered the town of Shechem. This is a dangerous situation. And so he sends Joseph to Shechem. And let's pick up uh, verse 15. And a man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, what are you seeking? I'm seeking my brothers, Joseph said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, they have gone away. For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. And they saw him from afar. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. And they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then he will say, then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him. And we will see what will become of his dreams. So here the brothers, they see Joseph coming and they concoct a murderous plan to kill him and then cover it up with a lie that a wild beast did it. This is the fruit of favoritism. This is the fruit of bitter jealousy. It leads to things like this. Now as the brothers are coming up with their plan, uh, Reuben, desiring to spare Joseph's life in order that Joseph might be restored to his father, Reuben steps in in verse 21. Let's read. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, let us not take his life. And Reuben said to him, shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. So here comes Joseph. He's approaching his brothers with goodwill. But instead, what he, he's expecting to be received well by them. But instead, he finds that they strip him of his robe, which was the very symbol of his favored status, and they toss him into a waterless pit. Now, how do you think Joseph feels right now? When someone who is supposed to be close to you betrays you, it can be one of the most disorienting things that can happen to anyone. When the very person who was supposed to care for you and help you and guide you and who claims to have loved you, when he turns on you and strips you and tosses you to the side in a pit as though you never even existed, it is an extremely jarring thing to go through. Sometimes when you go through this stuff, it's hard to believe that it's even really happening. And it sows a ton of confusion into your heart and it brings you incredible pain. And this is what's happening to Joseph. He's shocked. He's betrayed. He's persecuted. He's stripped down and he is trapped and he's in a pit and he's alone. He has no water and he is totally helpless. And the people who are supposed to love him the most are the ones who put him there. Let's pick up verse 25. Then they sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. And then, when, then Judas said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our, our, our hand be upon him, for he's our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. 
And then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. And so here in this story, Judah steps in. And when he sees a caravan of Ishmaelites, who again, they are the non-covenant seed of Abraham, Judah suggests to his brothers that they sell Joseph rather than kill him in order to make a profit and avoid having blood on their hands. I think Judah's being a total hypocrite here. I sense in this story that he, he's trying to act like a good guy, but really, he doesn't care about his brother at all. Instead, he cares about making a profit, and he sees his opportunity. And so he pers- persuades his brothers, and for 20 pieces of silver, Joseph is sold by his own brethren and taken captive to Egypt. Let's go ahead and continue the story in verse 29. When Reuben returned to the pit and he saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, the boy is gone and I, where shall I go? And so here, as we read these verses, we can see Reuben wasn't present at the time they told that, that they sold Joseph. It was his idea to put him in the pit and then they're sitting down to eat. Reuben must have left and they end up selling him while Reuben's gone. And so Reuben, as the oldest brother, he is really concerned because as the oldest brother, he could have been held responsible for Joseph's disappearance, which may have had horrible consequences for him. So he is afraid. And so the brothers here, driven by jealousy, driven by envy and hatred and greed and fear, and and with a desire to have no consequences for selling their brother into slavery, the brothers are now going to concoct an elaborate lie with which they shall deceive their father and thereby avoid accountability. Let's look at verses 31 and 32. Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. Here we see with this particular episode that just as Jacob had once deceived his own father through animal skin that mimicked Esau's, so also his sons are now deceiving him in connection to animals and the fate of his favorite son. And so one thing I think we could draw out of there is, look, when, when generational sins are not repented from, they pass on to the next generation and they have the, the same disastrous results. It is one thing as a parent to be a good example and have kids rebel against your faithful teaching and against your holy example. It is quite another thing to be a consistent example of sin and deceit and hypocrisy and then wake up one day and realize that your kids have imitated your falsehood. Jacob's name means deceiver and he cheats. And his entire life has been characterized by this sin and his kids have learned from him and they're imitating him. Yes, Jacob had recently been transformed. Yes, Jacob's beginning to walk in newness of life. However, one of the awful unintended consequences of his decades-long patterns of deceit is that now his children are imitating his poor example. And so I think it's important... To sit here and and, and observe how critical it is that we set forth a consistent and holy example to our children, lest they inherit our evil ways. Listen, there's no amount of great parenting that will guarantee your kid will be a Christian. But if your kid is not a believer, what you don't want to look back on is that I had this massive life of hypocrisy. And then right when they were, you know, 30, I finally came to know God and walk, but I gave him a 30 year example of hypocrisy. You don't want to be in that situation. If your kids turn from the Lord, you want to say, look, they turned from the Lord, but yeah, I wasn't perfect, but I gave them a faithful example. I gave them a faithful teaching of the word and they just rebelled. It is much better to be in that position than it is to be in the first one. 
And so here with these uh, brothers of Joseph, these children of Jacob, we see Jacob's kids here. They are so entitled. They are so justified. They are so hardened in their sin. And they are so blinded by their selfishness that all they can see is their desire to get rid of Joseph, to have 20 shekels, to indulge their sin, and to not get caught. And these brothers, they know what they're doing is evil. That's why they're hiding everything. But even though they knew these things were evil, it didn't stop them. And so knowing that their actions and their lies and their cover up is going to absolutely crush their father, Jacob, they still didn't care. They walked in their sin anyway. And this is the case with the self-centered. The self-centered are enslaved to them and what they want. And they are completely incapable of doing anything outside of themselves. They can't think about how things might impact others. They can't ever reach out to anyone. They can't ever see how anyone else is doing. They never try to minister to anybody. Because in their slavery to self, all they can ever care about or think about is their little world and their desires for sin and their cravings of the flesh and how they might indulge it. They are loveless, thoughtless, careless, cold, and calloused. This is what Jacob's family has become. And he himself was changed into Israel. He himself is starting to grow, but there was still a huge mess passed on to his family in part through his hypocrisy and it is snowballing on him. And verses 33 through 35 show the reaction of a heartbroken man and it should move us to pity. Let's read verses 33. Let's start with verse 33. And Jacob identified it and said, It is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without a doubt torn to pieces. So here we see the deception works. Jacob is fully convinced that an animal has killed Joseph. And when I read this, one of the thoughts that hits me is it is amazing how powerful lies can, uh, lies can be as they masquerade as the truth. Jacob is unsuspecting. He doesn't think his sons are capable of this type of deception. And so without any questioning, he believes with all of his heart that Joseph is dead because the robe, which is dripping with goat's blood, is all the evidence that he needs. And so fully convinced of the truthfulness of his children's lie, Jacob is totally devastated in verses 34 through 35. Let's read Then Jacob tore his garments and he put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted. And he said, no, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Jacob is so crushed that the text tells us he mourned for many days. In mourning, if you have ever mourned the loss of someone or something, it's an awful feeling. It, it's, a, it's a consuming feeling. It's all you can think about. And your grief, it's pretty much your only felt reality when you're in a state of mourning. And Jacob's grief here is so strong that he refuses to be comforted by his children. And in his heart, he believes he's going to go down to shale in mourning, which is another way of saying that he is so emotionally crushed by the death of his son that he believes he's going to be mourning until the day he dies. Shale is the place of the dead. And so in this life, Jacob believes he will never be the same because his dear son is gone. First, it was the death of Rachel, his beloved wife. And now he has lost his and Rachel's firstborn son that they had together. And so he is crushed. And part of the reason he's crushed, it's the parents who are supposed to be buried by their children, not the other way around. And so as I read this, not only am I moved to pity in relation to Jacob's grief, I, I, this had to be awful. But also, I'm blown away by how hardened his sons are. If you look back in what I just read in verse 34 and 35, it says all of his 
children sought to comfort him. That is crazy to me. I mean, his sons are the ones who sold Joseph. They are the ones who the ones who betrayed Joseph and the whole family. They are the ones who created the lie. They are the ones watching their father suffer greatly because of their lie. And in their lies, they're trying to comfort him. I mean, what hypocrisy, what hardness of heart, what depth of evil resides in these men? They hold the key to emotional freedom for Jacob by simply repenting of their lies, but they won't do it. And through their deceit, they have put their father in a prison of grief. It is incredible how hardened people can be. Sometimes it's hard to believe that people are really doing what they're doing. I I, I just... I can't believe they're trying to comfort him. Now, this is all extremely uplifting. Aren't you so glad you came to church today? Uh, I I just preached a text. Talk to God about what's in the Bible. But let's start to move towards some extremely hope-giving realities that we can draw out of this. If you trace our steps tonight from chapter 35, verse 16, all the way to the end of chapter 7, you will find, if you haven't noticed already, God is not mentioned one time. Not even in passing. And what's happened during that span? What happened between 35, 16 and the end of 37? Here, let, let's recap it. Okay, Rachel has died. Billah was raped. Uh, And she was raped by Reuben, nonetheless, Jacob's firstborn. Isaac died. Esau's serpent seed descendants have greatly multiplied. The sins of favoritism, jealousy, envy, hatred, lying, deception, greed, and violence. They've dealt a devastating blow to the household of Jacob, resulting in such great grief that he thinks he's going to die with incurable pain in his heart. So if there is ever a story that makes you think God is absent, it's this one. Sometimes in life, we go through the same types of seasons, the same types of stories. We follow God and whatever the circumstances are, whether they're brought on in part because of our sin, as was the case with Jacob, or whether we've been blameless and innocent, as with the case of Joseph, sometimes the darkness seems so smothering that we don't feel like we can see one step in front of us. Sometimes in our grief, all we can perceive is what we think is the absence of God in our life. And sometimes our perception of his absence, it's so powerful that we feel like we can't, I can't hear anything from God. I have no idea what he's doing in my life. I don't know what he's trying to show me. Nothing. All I know is I feel blank and hopeless and like he's gone. And sometimes in our inability to perceive God's presence, to perceive his hand, to hear his voice, we can almost be driven mad. And like Jacob, we can become overcome with despair. And in these seasons, we are super vulnerable. And if it's not for the grace of God, we'll be totally lost. Sometimes you're going to have seasons in your life where God isn't written for three chapters. But it doesn't mean God's not in the story. And in fact, if we pay closer attention to what we've read tonight, is just horrible as it's been, I see at least four reasons to have hope from what we've read tonight. First, We have within this story the giving of two prophetic dreams from God to Joseph. Joseph will indeed rise to a position of power and his father, his siblings, and all who are with Jacob, they will indeed bow down to him one day. And so embedded in this dark story is a prophecy that the current state of things is not the final word. 
In the despair and evil of chapter 37, there is the potential to forget about the hope that came from Joseph's prophetic dreams and all who fail to lay hold of the low of who all who fail to lay hold of the hope that is laced within stories that seem hopeless, they end up being consumed in despair like Jacob. Though Jacob once pondered this dream that uh, Joseph had, he can no longer even remember it. All he sees is his grief. And I'm going to be this way till I die. But God had put something right there in the story. Jacob just can't perceive it. Second, we know the story is not hopeless because the very thing that appears to crush Jacob's heart It is literally dripping with falsehood. Yes, the blood-drenched robe really is Joseph's robe, but the blood belongs to a goat. And it is so helpful, I think, to know that in in the things that break our hearts, there might be more to the story. Sometimes we see the story as it really is and it just breaks our heart because it's horrible and we see it rightly. But it's, it's edifying to know sometimes... Maybe there's more to the story. Sometimes things that seem to be dripping with, the, with death and seem, but things that seem to be hopeless, they, in fact, they are nothing more than Satan's well-disguised lies decide, designed to sink you into despair so you can give up your faith, abandon your walk, and turn from your calling. And I think an encouragement here is that sometimes... Even if you're not sure where the deception might be, just knowing that maybe God hasn't revealed everything about your grief yet, that can be a a significant comfort. And here's an application about it. Fear making major life changes based on a lie. That should be something that you fear doing. Knowing that sometimes things that look hopeless might be dripping with goat's blood, and it's not Joseph's blood, that should slow you down. Because sometimes when you're in so much pain like Jacob, you just want to make some huge decision because somehow you think it's going to help get out of your pain. Slow down. Don't do that. Knowing that there are robes dripping with goat's blood in your life, it can cause you to become more prudent and more thoughtful and to evaluate things slower. And it can prevent you from giving up on God, giving up on a path that he puts you on because you're deceived by a lie. So maybe in whatever you're going through, something looks really dark. It looks really hopeless, but really it's goat's blood. It isn't Joseph's blood. Third, we know that there's hope in this story because chapter 37, verse one, how did it begin again? It draws our attention to the fact that Jacob's in the land of promise. This is the land that is Jacob's spiritual heritage. This is the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants. This is the land that God had worked so mightily to bring him back to when he was with Laban. This is the land where God will protect him from his enemies. This is the land where God dwells with Abraham's seed in a special way. And so even in a context of sin, hardships, and calamity, these things are true. Jacob is exactly where God brought him back to be. Exactly where God pledged to return him to in Genesis 28. That's exactly where Jacob is. And so I I think you can take from this. Sometimes it's refreshing to remember that we've been put in our setting by God. God put us where we're at to accomplish his good purposes In us, nothing's been in vain, nothing's been pointless, and our promise keeping God is still at work. God put us here. That doesn't mean He approved of every sinful choice and dysfunctional situation that puts you where you're at, but He's still sovereign over it all, and He's got you here. So that is an encouragement. Fourth, we see hope in the story through the statements of verse 36, the last verse of chapter 37. And this verse comes on the heels of Jacob's incurable grief. Verse 36, let's read it. 
Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Why do I see hope in that verse? Uh, Here's why. Though Jacob thinks Joseph's dead, in reality, Joseph has been sold as a slave to Potiphar, who is a prominent officer of Pharaoh. And so what we see once again in this verse is just like with the robe, things are not always what they appear to be. For Jacob, his son is not actually dead. And for Joseph, what appears to be his end and his utter ruination and his final undoing, it's actually going to become the birthplace of his rise to power. It looks like Joseph will waste his days in meaningless slavery, having been completely abandoned and betrayed by his loved ones and even forgotten by God. But in reality, what's going to happen by the end of the story is that God is going to use his enslavement in Potiphar's house to, yes, increase his suffering, but also to eventually lead him to the place that will prove to be instrumental in his deliverance and in his rise to prominence in Egypt. So as you look on the dark days of your life, whether they came upon you in some measure as a consequence for your sin, like is what happened with Jacob, or whether they have been thrust upon you as you walk in blamelessness, as was the case with Joseph, the days are never hopeless. God is never absent, even if it seems like his name hasn't come up for three chapters in your life. God's, what what, what did we meditate on last week? God's immeasurable power towards those who believe. Listen, God's immeasurable power is still at work towards Jacob. It's still at work towards Joseph. It's still at work towards us, even when it looks like God has no power or that he refuses to use it for us. And so for the believer, in every chapter of your story, God is always present, even if his name's not explicitly written there. And so throughout our journey, even in the dark chapters of our lives, there are always these little seeds of encouragement, even if you can't see them. In your life, the encouragements may not have the same expression as the Joseph story. I doubt any of you have had a dream that your 11 brothers are going to uh, serve you. So they may not be the exact same details. But in principle, if we look at the Joseph story... Typically, for every betrayal we experience, there is a godly dream that must be fulfilled that we've just had. For every confusing hardship, like being totally stunned that your brothers just dropped you in a pit. For every confusing hardship, there's the reality that you're in the place where God wanted you. And so if you're feeling dark today or if you're feeling great today and you just know dark days are coming, I want you to to encourage you to really and truly take inventory of any spiritual blessing you can put your finger on. It might have helped Jacob's grief to remember the dream Joseph had. It might have helped his grief to remember God appearing to him when he was with Laban saying, I'm bringing you back to the land. Go to Beth. That might have helped his grief to think about it. And so when you're in a dark season, if you you discipline yourself to try to discern any little tiny blessing from God in your life, it can help you in the sense that it helps orient you a little bit and not make you as dizzy when you're going through crazy things. I know because it's helped me a bunch of times through that. And everywhere the scriptures are filled with, especially in the Psalms, to recount the deeds of the Lord. Remember what God has done. Everywhere the scriptures filled with that. And I would also put to you that in your dark days, Uh, I think it's helpful to ask yourself, is it possible that maybe you're not seeing everything that's that's there? Is Satan sowing thoughts of despair in your life with goat's blood that appears to be Joseph's? Is he pressing things on your heart and mind that are so discouraging but seem so real that it makes you think God is absent and there is no hope? Anything in your life that's making you feel like there's no hope, it's not from God, it's from Satan. 
God is never moving us to do that unless, we're, of course, we're hoping in ourselves. And yeah, if you're hoping in yourself, there is no hope. But if you're trying to hope in God and something or someone is in your life telling you there's no hope with God, it's not from God. It's from the devil. Guarantee. It's dripping with goat's blood. God doesn't sow confusion and despair into someone's life who hopes in Him. In fact, what does the word say? No one who hopes in Him will ever be put to shame. So whatever is tempting you to despair and give up on God, don't believe it. it is, it's goat's blood. And ask God if maybe you're missing any, <laughs> any dreams that He's given you or, or any little uh, measures of encouragement. Ask God if maybe you're blinded to that. Ask God if He could help you see those things in your life right now that are these encouragements from Him that your grief has blinded you towards. Ask God if there's any bl- goat's blood masquerading as Joseph's blood designed to make you despair, turn your back on God, and leave the path He has for you. Ask God. God knows what those things are ask him to show you so listen God is working in your life if you are among those who believe God's taking horrible things and through them God is refining you he's shaping you he's molding you he's building you he's teaching you he's strengthening you he's equipping you and he is working out his perfect plan for you even if you have no clue how the painful pieces of your life are fitting together God's still doing these things even if it looks like all of the Rachels and Isaacs in your life have died all you can see is the growth of Esau's serpent descendants your family has betrayed you and now you're imprisoned and you're destined for a life of meaningless slavery even if that's your situation God's still working nothing is meaningless or without glorious purpose in God's ways towards his children And so, as we kind of uh, close out here, I want to just give you some encouragements. And yes, they're redundant, but sometimes we need to hear the same thing over and over again. So, God's still working. I want to encourage you for your good, even if the sins of your life have brought painful consequences and have hurt others. That's what happened with Jacob, right? Jacob was not... Jacob brought a lot of destruction into his family. And... <clears throat> What, we're gonna, what we've already seen in Jacob's life and what we'll eventually see in his life is super encouraging. Though Jacob brought tons of destruction into his family, Jacob was transformed. And he went from deceiver to Israel. And he learned how to walk with God. And then even though Jacob had to watch uh, the fruit of his hypocrisy get passed down to his children who also became deceivers, you know what Jacob's going to see by the end of his life? His family transformed. Especially Judah. I love Judah's story. And so, again, God, even if you're in a dark season because of your sin, man, God's full of mercy. He's full of grace. And He is so good at like working out horrible things in ways that bring Him glory in a manner that we never would have expected. We're like, wow, way to go, God. That was awesome. Like He's really good at that. And so, nothing's... Ever, ever hopeless with God. But for the one who lacks faith, for the one who turns from God before the glorious end of their story is written, you can be certain that if you let doubt and unbelief cause you to walk away from God, your story will have an awful ending. But if you trust the unseen God, if you hope in the one who seems absent or who seems absent right now, in due time he is going to minister to you. You will see his hand again. You will discern his work in your life once more. You will be made fit through suffering to serve him in a more spiritually enriched way, and you will end your life with praise for God, and your journey will bring him great glory. God's never absent. But how you respond to times where it seems like He is, it makes all the difference in the spiritual power of your walk. 
So the last thing I want to close here with, I'm sorry, I know it's a little bit long. I think, I think, don't hold me to this. I think next week will be shorter, but just don't hold me to it. But I, I got to say this last part. I want to close with the reminder that wherever you're at in your journey, remember you have a savior who has went through the same things. Jesus was betrayed by his own. Jesus was handed over to the false seed of Abraham. Jesus was sold to the Gentiles. Jesus suffered unjustly. Jesus was hated and rejected. Jesus had his enemies who were insanely jealous of him. And as he hung on a cross to die for our sins, everything appeared hopeless and godless and pointless. In fact, it appeared so awful that for three hours, darkness literally came over the land in the middle of the day while he was dying on the cross. Now, when you talk about a powerful appearance of hopelessness and darkness, it was the cross. And not only that, but from the cross, Jesus literally cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Nothing was darker, nothing was more evil, and nothing had the appearance of being more hopeless and pointless than the murder of Jesus Christ. But it was precisely through the appearance of God having nothing to do with Christ's death. It was through the apparent hopeless situation. It was through the thick daytime darkness that covered the cross. And it was through the painful betrayal of his closest friends and of the nation Israel that Jesus was doing his greatest work. Here's the irony of the cross. And for all believers, this is what's true of our life at every uh, at all times here's the irony of the cross though the cross is smothered with darkness it's brimming with divine light though the cross occurred because of sin it is the invitation to forgiveness though the cross happened through betrayal it is the central place of reconciliation And though it appeared at the cross as though all had failed, it is the place of ultimate victory. And though Jesus himself rightly cried out to God that he had really been forsaken by God, and he was, nevertheless, God was still present doing his greatest work, even when he forsook Christ as he punished him for sins. And so nothing in our lives appears more hopeless than the cross did. But because of the cross, nothing in our lives is ever without hope. So Jesus Christ told us he has no way, no place to lay his head. He had no home here. He had he, he, had, he didn't have any possessions. He's poor. He's homeless. He was despised. He was rejected by men. And Hebrews 5.8 and Hebrews 2.10 tell us that Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. And having been perfected through suffering, he became the source of eternal life for all who believe. So whether you're suffering from your own sin or you are suffering from right, for righteousness sake, God can comfort you. He can minister to you. He can heal your heart. If you will draw near to him. And as we saw last week, God works immeasurable power towards you who believe, even in situations where he seems completely absent. Most of our New Year's things are next year. I've never, have you ever read a Facebook post that said, next year is going to be the darkest year of my life? Have you ever read anybody say that? You haven't? I've never read that. Everybody looks ahead to the new year and says nothing bad's going to happen. And then when you hear a sermon like last week, a measurable power power of God to those who believe, you might wrongly conclude that, yeah, God's a measurable power and nothing bad's going to happen. So that's why I like so much by God's providence, we're back in Genesis in the place that we are. Here's God's a real immeasurable power. When things are totally dark and dysfunctional and his name hasn't been mentioned for three chapters, he's working with his immeasurable power towards those who believe. So look to the cross, bring your sins, hoping God, he's there. He loves you. He cares about you. He hasn't gone anywhere. Just believe and don't let any goat's blood or any real suffering that you rightly perceive cause you to despair and turn away from the Lord. So that's it.
So, are there any uh, questions or comments? Well, let's pray, and then we will close. Uh, Do we have a closing song tonight, Matt? Yeah, all right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your, as we saw last week, your immeasurable power towards those who believe. And now, God, we thank you, as we see this week, that you have immeasurable power towards sinners like Jacob, power to save them, power to change them, and power even to work in the consequences of the sin that they brought on. God, we, we praise you for that. That's so awesome, God. We, we praise you for that. We thank you also for your immeasurable power to work in the life of people like Joseph who didn't do anything wrong but were betrayed by their brothers and who are in a place of suffering that seems pointless. We praise you for your power to work in those situations and bring about things that will cause you to be praised in wonderful ways. God, we thank you so much for this, Lord. And Father, we just... Um, I just feel led, God, to just corporately, you know everyone that's part of our body, God, and you know every doubt everyone's wrestling with. I don't know them, but you do. And so I just lift them all up to you. And I ask by your grace, Lord, that you would please just drive out any sorts of doubts towards you. Doubts towards your goodness, doubts towards your love and your presence and your gospel and your promises, any of that. God, just eliminate those things. God, I pray for us that if things are wrongly causing us despair because we're deceived, if there's any goat's blood uh, in our life, God, help us see it and recognize it for what it is, Lord. We pray for that. And if there are encouragements in our life that we're failing to look at, God, remind us of what those things are and help us look at those things and rejoice in you once more. But no matter what, God, I just pray, make our hearts full, full of hope in you, full of faith in you, God, and full of gladness that we've been redeemed by Jesus Christ and that we have a Father who works everything for our good and that you walk with us and care even about gray hairs and that goodness and mercy follows us every day of our life. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.